Chapter 4, Measures of Variability, Part 2, Standard Deviation and Variance for a Sample. Goal of Inferential Statistics. We learned in Chapter 1 that we would be um, presented with the concepts, or were presented with the concepts of descriptive statistics, which means that we organize and summarize data, and we do so with graphs and tables, the mean and the standard deviation as illustrations of summation or summary of a distribution. But the goal of inferential statistics is by definition to draw conclusions about a population using sample statistics. So we draw conclusions about population and it's based on limited information from a sample. And the reason we use samples is because it's hard to obtain or have access to all members of a population. So we tend to use representative samples, many populations, to conduct research. So the samples differ from the population. Samples have less variability, and um, computing the variance and standardization in the same way um, as for a population would give a biased estimate in the population value. So again, this idea that samples have less variability, if we consider the um, average age in this class, Again, well, let's just say it's equal to average age of this class is 21. We recognize that it may not be what the actual population parameter is equal to. Let's say the actual population parameter is equal to 23. What would account for the difference? Well, the population includes all values, all x values, and it includes the 90-year-old and the 13-year-old in our population. And that has a, a math, um, an effect on the mathematical computation of the mean. And what we often see is that samples rarely include these extreme scores. It could possibly include extreme score, but it's unlikely. And the reason is because the number of those extreme scores is minimal. We don't have a lot of 90-year-olds and we don't have a lot of 13-year-olds. And so when we take a sample, let's say this class, and we calculate the um, average age of this class, it's not going to in be inclusive of those extremes. And those extremes are reflective of variability or consistency of x values or scores in a distribution. So we have to understand that samples have less variability. Here's a visual to better understand this. If we take the population of um, adult heights, and I'm going to use the values that were presented in a previous um, slide and let's say the average height of adults is equal to 70 inches and um, we have on the low end 58 inches and on the high end 82 inches so that's the whole span of the variation of heights in the population from 58 inches to 82 inches and we take a sample and let's count our x um, character down at the bottom. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. We take a sample of 10 individuals and we um, collect the data on their heights. Um, and let's see here. And we still, let's say, come up with the same average of 70, but the span of scores is different. Let's say that the span of heights for the sample that we collected of 10 individuals ranges from 65 to 75 inches. So this range here is encompassing these um, 10 data points that we collected. What does that say about the variability and the difference between the sample and the population? Well, the span of scores from 65 inches to 75 inches I hope you would agree and see that is smaller than the range of 58 to 82. So the population variability is going to be much greater and the sample variability is often not going to reflect that as great of variation because it includes less values, less scores, less data points um, than we would see reflected in the population. And again, the sample is, is unlikely to include those extremes. Um, of 58, inch, 58 inches and 82 inches. So we have to take that into consideration and, and also make an adjustment in the calculations to reflect the inconsistency of sample variance in relation to population variance.
So um, sum of squares, SS, is computed um, as before. We, again, can use the computational or definitional formulas to come up with our SS value. And the formula for variance has n minus 1 in the denominator rather than n in the, um, because, again, so population variance we learned was equal to SS over capital N. But for sample, and our notation for variance is S squared, is equal to SS over N minus 1. So again, N is sample size, and we're going to deduct one from that. What does that do to the quotient when we're doing this mathematically? If we divide by a lesser number, a smaller number, you should um, recognize that by dividing by a smaller number is going to increase the quotient. So mathematically, we are compensating for the fact that the variability of the sample tends to be smaller than what is actually reflected in the population. So mathematically, we're correcting that by dividing by n minus 1 versus just lowercase n, the sample size. So the notation um, uses S instead of lowercase Greek letter sigma to denote variance of a sample. So here, variance of a sample, this is the new notation, and the equation is SS, sum of squared deviations, over N minus 1. And we'll learn in just a second that N minus 1 is also referred to as degrees of freedom, DF. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. You'll see a lot of um, what are referred to as synonyms of these equations, so um, it always, won't always be the same notation, so you have to learn all of the equivalent equations for each um, statistic, such as variance or standard deviation. Standard deviation of the sample is denoted by S and is equal to the square root of SS over N minus 1, which is the equation for variance, so we can also see S is equal to the square root of variance. Um, this could also reflect the square root of SS over degrees of freedom because we'll learn in just a second that degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1 for one sample. And at the, um, I'll, I'll produce a separate lecture and, and show you all the notation so you get it all straight um, with along with each of the um, equations for each statistic to make sure that you have the notation correct, the definition, and then the equation that coincides with each, with each statistic. So this slide, figure 4.5, is coming from example 4.5 on page 101 of your text. And again, it's the estimate of standard deviation. I'm not going to walk through the whole example, but I encourage you to look at the computational process for computing variance and standard deviation for this sample on those pages that I reference. So the equations lead us to recognize that the mean of this particular distribution, and this is a sample, so let me change that notation. The notation should reflect what we're working with. We're working with the sample, so m is equal to 6.5, and they've calculated the standard deviation to equal six, uh, 2.62. But um, again, I encourage you to walk through the um, calculations um, as to how they arrived at these um, values. But what I want to use this slide for is just to show you the estimate. So again, if we want to estimate a standard deviation of a sample, we, take, we would first calculate the mean. In this case, we're told that it's equal to 6.5. And then we would consider the distance to the value that's furthest from the mean, and in this case it is an x equal to 11, and it deviates by 4.5 points. And then we consider the score that is closest um, to the mean of 6.5. So it could be either be 6 or 7, and they deviate in the same amount. So to estimate it, we would consider the closest distance, which is 0.5, and um, the furthest distance of 4.5. So we estimate the standard deviation to be somewhere between 0.5 and 4.5. And so if we would take those two deviations um, into consideration, average them, so we would take 0.5 plus 4.5 over 2. Again, we want to average the distance. Again, mean 
is always equal to the sum of whatever we're interested over the number of items we have. So we take, in this case, we want to know the average um, of the distance from the mean. So 0 0.5 plus 4.5 gives us 5 divided by 2, and our estimated standard deviation is equal to 2.5. Again, this is just a rough estimate, think considering the furthest score from the mean and the closest score to the mean. And notice it's quite um, close to the actual that's computed um, in that particular example, 4.5 on page 101 and 102. So again, the purpose of estimating is to help reconcile the actual answer that you come up with to make sure that they're pretty close so that you um, assure yourself that you haven't made any mathematical errors. So degrees of freedom, the population variance, the mean is known. We know exactly what the average or the mean of a population is because every x value is taken into consideration when calculating the mean of that distribution. Deviations are computed from a known mean. We know exactly what the mean is equal to. Sample variance as estimate of the population. Again, um, that graph that I showed you of adult heights showed the span of the original population heights and then the subset, the sample that was taken. So it's always an estimate of the population. The population mean is unknown when we use a sample. So again, that, that graph actually showed what the mean was. I gave you the mean, but in reality, if we're, we're considering a population to study, we're going to take a sample and we're going to use, essentially use M to estimate mu because we don't have access to all of the X values to calculate mu. So using sample mean restricts the variability as we, we saw in that slide. Um, that we don't have a perfect assessment of variation because we recognize the sample isn't inclusive of all the extremes that um, are reflected in the population. Degrees of freedom refers to the number of scores in a sample that are independent and free to vary. So if we're taking a sample, every time we take a sample from a population, the mean potentially changes, right? My average age in this class may be very different from the average age in another class, um, but they're all coming from the population. Mu is not going to change. If we have access to all x values, mu remains constant, but every sample, so sample 1, right, I would have mean 1, and let's say average age is 21 in, in one class, sample 2, the mean is equal to 20, and let's say sample um, 3 has a mean equal to 23. So again, the mu is not going to change, but every time we take a sample, that sample statistic changes. And um, we refer to degrees of freedom as the number of scores in a sample that are independent and free to vary the x values. And we refer to that as degrees of freedom and is equal to n minus 1. For an expanded um, presentation of degrees of freedom, I refer you to example 4.6 in the text in page 103 to, um, for you to better understand this idea of number of scores that are free to vary. Essentially, it simply means that if you have the calculated mean, you have a certain amount of scores, you know the value of scores, um, it will be one value that um, is restricted and is not free to vary because of the parameters of the sample mean and the number of scores and the x values for those scores. So what that means for us in terms of calculating sample variance, we just recognize that when we see degrees of freedom, it's equivalent to a sample size minus one. And as I mentioned before, when we divide by a smaller number, we're inflating the quotient and accounting for the fact that samples don't reflect the whole um, or entire variability demonstrated in a population. So it's a mathematical correction um, for the estimates of a sample when we're talking about a population. Okay, so a quick learning check. A sample of four scores. So again, we need to learn to interpret um, verbiage and relate that to necessary notation. So that means n is equal to 
four has the sum of square deviations equal to 24, what is the variance equal to? So again, sample variance is equal to S squared, and we know that that is equal to SS, the sum of squared deviations over N minus one, which can also be written as SS over degrees of freedom. So, we want to calculate variance of the sample. We are given, let's replace variables, SS is equal to 24. We know that N minus uh, 1, so degrees of freedom is equal to N minus 1. And in this case, degrees of freedom would equal 4 minus 1. That's equal to 3. So divided by 3. So 24 divided by 3 is equal to 8. So we've concluded that our variance is equal to 8. Again, variance is, by definition, equals the average of squared deviations. Okay, so again, these are the types of questions that you'll be presented. You'll be given uh, variables either in word format or notation and you're asked to solve for one of these statistics that is reflective of variability. Next, describe if each of the following statements is true or false. So true or false, the sample systematically has less variability than a population. And we've learned that that is true, that samples um, are coming from the population and tend to have less variation than what is reflected in the population. So that is true, that samples have less variability than a population. And we mathematically correct that when we're using sample statistics to estimate populations, we correct that by dividing by a smaller number when calculating variance to inflate the quotient, to inflate the, re um, the variability reflecting the sample that pertains to a certain population. Next, true or false, the standard deviation is the distance from the mean to the farthest point of the distant, uh, distribution curve. Technically, that's false. What, what standard deviation rep represents is the standard deviation between the furthest and the closest point. So it's the average um, deviation between those two when we're estimating standard deviation. So we consider the score that's furthest from the mean and the, closest, and the score that's closest to the mean we consider those distances and average them to get this estimated standard deviation. And that concludes part two of chapter four, Measures of Variability.